Preface What we need to do is to envision the digital future of your business. Without a compelling vision of where you are going and why it is imperative, you will probably be painting ray stripes on a 20-year-old Chevy. What assets will be valuable in a digitally transformed business? How can you transform customer experience, inter internal operations, your business model? How can units work differently and work together differently in a more connected way? Look at the media industry. It has been completely transformed by digital technology. Some are putting their toes in the water. A few have jumped in and find they aren't drowning. They are reaping huge results. A very familiar, important and inevitable question we need to face these days is Is my business equipped enough to get disrupted? The risk that the disruption can happen highly radically if you are not prepared for it beforehand. If you do believe it could happen, it is well worth getting away from the office to consider what to do very soon to avert it. Taking the time to have a serious answer might make all the difference in success or failure three years from now. The next question is this. If you or your company isn't ready, what should you do about it? It is important to think through what you personally should do as opposed to what the company should do. You can only influence the corporate approach. The answer will set your agenda for the next six months. A change is indeed coming and it is coming thick and fast. Transformation is occurring. It is about how people collaborate and work. It is about the way business processes are executed. It is most certainly about how we understand our customers and obsess about the experience. It is about how we use digital technology to radically shift how we provide amazing experiences for our customers. It is radical and it is now. Customers are in charge. That is a profound shift. At our core, do we get that shift? There is a convergence of customers being in control and are designing experiences that easily help them reach their goals. What if we don't? They will let everyone know about it and go somewhere else. It is that simple. Do you see it coming? As senior managers, you alone possess the skills and resources to make it happen. You can decide to transform and survive, or you cannot. No one else can make that happen. It is up to you to create the vision. It is up to you to decide who is on the bus and who is not. Here is the tough thing. Not all of your people and senior management gets it. To assume otherwise will hinder you. You need to decide who is on board and who is not. You need to get those who are not on board of the bus as gently as you can, but as soon as possible. Delay will only hinder you and you know it. You desire to strive to digital maturity and make it happen is something that really matters. You need to make sure there are targets for progress, they are well known and they are met. That cannot be delegated. Communicating the vision can't be delegated either. It is up to you to take a stand. It is up to you to communicate it. The message needs to get through and no one else can do it. Do develop a serious communication plan. Make sure that it is followed. You have to decide that monitoring engagement with a vision is measured. If you don't decide that, who else will? You have to decide to iterate the vision, goals and strategies. You have the starting point, but others will add and enhance what you start with. Setting up an iterative process gains commitment and value. Just remember to not let people wander off into infertile territory. Having started with a great vision, goals and strategies, you have to make investment decisions. Again, no one else can do that for you. You have to decide what the priorities are and fund them. Only you can cut across silos and departments to integrate the work. You have to coordinate digital initiatives that radically transform traditional operational initiatives. The keepers of the silos will not think that way and it is unreasonable to think they will. You have to do and you will have to force some of the funding in spite of what others may think. You will have to decide what the KPIs and metrics need to be. Others can inform that but you must agree and sometimes disagree with what the levers are to get you to make progress on your goals and strategies. You need to decide what is the process you will use to make necessary adjustments. Adjustments will need to be made. 
assuming otherwise has you blindly executing initiatives that get off track. All of this needs to start with a C suit. Others will support the effort, but without the CEO, vision and commitment, transformation will not occur. It will be more of the flavor of the month approach with employees and customers and very tired of. Finally, there are real constraints here, but they are not as dire as you may believe. Jeff Bezos has funded Amazon but never allowing the corporation to take a profit. It is a bold strategy. It pays off. Here are the key ideas. First, what assets will be valuable in a digitally transformed business? Eliminate those that are marginal. Second, how can you transform customer experience, internal operations, your business model? You have to decide the transformation roadmap. Third, need to understand how units work together and importantly work differently but in a much more connected way. Introduction Today we are living at a time when all the traditional rules of business seem to have changed in a big way due to the penetration of digital technologies as well as threats attached with it. These, in turn, are forcing the business models and processes to go through a constant chain like we see in other fields, like that of teaching and advising business leaders from companies around the world. It is repeatedly heard the same urgent question. How do we adapt and transform for the digital age? Businesses founded before the rise of the internet face a stark challenge. Many of the fundamental rules and assumptions that governed and grew their businesses in the pre-digital era no longer hold. The good news is that change is possible. Pre-digital businesses are not dinosaurs doomed to extinction. Here we get into a thorough discussion of the phenomenon of digitalization. What separates businesses that manage to adapt and thrive in a digital world from those who fail? In pursuing the answers to this question, it's a privilege to draw on the insights, perspectives and questions of an amazing range of executives and entrepreneurs, both through my consulting and keynote speaking and in my Columbia Business School executive programs on digital marketing and digital business strategy. Extensive studies and research work is conducted on big data and marketing metrics, mobile shopping behaviors, the Internet of Things and the future of data sharing. Along with it, the experience of convening C-suit leaders from global brands, technology firms, media companies and fast-growing startups to get into this discussion of newly formed and constantly changing digital business landscape, one central insight that has emerged and shaped the development of this entire topic. Digitalization is not about technology, it is about strategy and new ways of thinking. Digitalization requires businesses to develop their strategic mindset much more than development of the IT infrastructure. This truth is apparent in the changing roles of technology leadership within business. A chief information officer's traditional role has been to use technology to optimize processes, reduce risks and better run the existing business. But the emerging role of a chief digital officer is much more strategic, focused on using technology to reimagine and reinvent the core business itself. A business strategy which is holistic on its view is much more useful for digitalization. Another title named The Network is Your Customer was focused on the impact of digital technologies on customers, their behaviors, interactions and relationships with businesses and organizations of all kinds. In the present task, it is being looked at five domains of business strategy – customers, competition, data, innovation and value. The Digital Transformation Playbook focuses on practical tools and frameworks that readers can apply in making decisions and formulating strategies for their own business, no matter their size or industry. The texts have been packed with case studies that illustrate the concepts and illuminate the strategies. The greater goal of this present project is the hope that you, the reader, will bring the playbook into action by applying its lessons and discovering the next stage of value creation and growth for your business. Due to network effects, the platform with the most current customers is often the one most likely to draw future customers. But the network of participating customers can add benefits beyond sheer numbers. 
the quality of goods and services customers offer is often important as well. Etsy has built a platform for selling handmade goods by nurturing a community of craftspeople making quality goods of a kind you may not find on eBay. The data provided by one group of customers can also increase the ability of a platform to attract customers of another group. The amount of social, demographic and personal interest data that users provide to Facebook is precisely the reason the company can charge advertisers relatively high rates. Platform added value In some cases, the value provided by the various types of customers is not enough to make a platform competitive. The platform itself has to develop unique features and benefits to attract customers. Google attracts users to Android phones with its Google Now personal assistant and the seamless integration of its popular Maps, Calendar and Gmail. Its competitor, Apple, attracts users with its own software like iTunes and the Siri personal assistant and the unique hardware design of its iPhones. For ad-supported media platforms, the biggest area of competition is their platform added value, that is, the content they create to attract their audience. That content may be subsidized or provided entirely free to the consumer thanks to advertiser revenue. Although a video channel or blog competes with its peers by trying to make attractive content, its real business model is to sell the audience to advertisers. Chapter 1 Digitalization needs platform. The renter's deposit until after they have left and the host has verified their home is in good shape. As further assurance, it provides each host with $1 million in insurance for damages. It has also added verification of both parties through detailed user profiles, ID verification and links to social networks like Facebook. That list has since been updated. When the United States re-established ties with Cuba in 2015, Airbnb was one of the first American companies to announce it had secured a firm presence there. Rethinking competition Airbnb is an example of a platform, a class of business that are rethinking which competitive assets need to be owned by a firm, e.g. rental properties and trained service staff, and which can be managed through new kinds of external relationships. These platform businesses are part of a broad transformation of the domain of competition and the relationships between firms. In the past, competition took place between similar rival businesses and within clearly defined industries with stable boundaries. Businesses created value within their own organization and in partnership with their suppliers and sales channels. But in the digital age, the boundaries between industries are blurring and so is the distinction between partners and competitors. Every relationship between firms today is a constantly shifting mix of competition and cooperation. Think of the television business. In the traditional view, a network like HBO partners with cable companies for distribution and it competes with networks like Showtime or AMC companies with the same business model and a similar offering for customers. But as digitization has transformed media, HBO has found itself competing with Netflix, an asymmetric challenger that is going after the same customers with a different pricing model and a completely different means of distribution. As the boundaries of the television industry have been redefined, HBO must compete for leverage against its distribution partners, cable companies like Comcast, as well as that of Time Warner, previous owner of HBO. It also must compete for leverage against some of its own star talent, who now have the option to work with firms like Netflix or Amazon as they develop their own original programming for direct distribution to viewers. At the same time, Three of the biggest broadcast television networks, ABC, NBC and Fox, have put aside their rivalry to cooperate in creating Hulu, a digital channel that aggregates all their content for online viewing with a mix of advertising and subscriber revenue. Clearly, the shape of interfirm competition and cooperation in the world of television has gotten very complicated. The digital revolution is redefining competition and relationships between firms in several ways. It is superchanging the growth of platform businesses like Airbnb. For businesses like HBO, it is disintermediating and reshuffling channel and partner relationships. 
More broadly, it is shifting the locus of competition. Competition is happening less within industries and less between similar companies that seek to replace each other. It is happening more across industries and between partners who rely on each other for success. Lastly, digital technology is increasing the importance of competition where companies that compete directly in some arenas find it valuable to act as partners in other areas. Clear distinctions between partners and rivals blurred distinctions between partners and rivals. Competition is a zero-sum game. Competitors cooperate in key areas. Key assets are held inside the firm. Key assets reside in outside networks. Products with unique features and benefits. Platforms with partners who exchange value. A few dominant competitors per category. Winner takes all due to network effects. This chapter explores the changing dynamics of competition and inter-firm relationships and their particular impact on platform businesses. It also presents two strategic planning tools. The first is the Platform Business Model Map, which can be used to analyze or design new platform businesses by understanding how they exchange value between different types of partners. The second is the competitive value train, which provides a lens for understanding the simultaneous competition and cooperation among supply chain partners, traditional rivals and asymmetric competitors and for planning strategic moves to increase a business's competitive leverage. Going forward, you can take my use of the term platform to refer to these multi-sided platform business models. It is by applying these economic theories that we can begin to understand the power and unique value of businesses like Airbnb, Uber or Xiaomi. A definition of platforms. The most precise and illuminating description of what constitutes a platform comes from the work of Andre Hagiu and Julian Wright that has been included in this definition are worth noting. Distinct types of customers. To be a platform, the business model must provide services to two or more different facets of client needs or types of customers. These can be buyers and sellers, software developers and consumers, merchants and cardholders, and banks, etc. The need for distinct sides explains why a pure communication network, such as Skype, fax or telephone, is not a platform. Although it connects customers to each other, the customers are all of the same type. The unique dynamics of platforms arise because they bring together different parties that each play different roles and contribute and receive different kinds of value. Direct interaction Platforms must enable these two or more sides to interact directly, that is, with a degree of independence. In a platform such as Airbnb or eBay, the two parties are free to create their own profiles, set and negotiate pricing and decide how they want to present their services or products. This is a critical distinction between a platform and a reseller or sales channel. The independence of interaction is why our definition of platforms does not include a supermarket connecting brands with shoppers or a vertically integrated consulting firm connecting clients with its hired employees. Facilitating Even though the interactions are not dictated by the platform business, they must take place through it and be facilitated by it. This is why our definition of platforms does not include a franchise business like McDonald's or H&R Block, which provides brand licensing, training and support services to individual owners who open branch businesses. Although franchises do, in some sense, enable commerce between the franchises, e.g. restaurant owners, and end consumers, e.g. restaurant patrons. That commerce does not flow through the original corporation and only one party, the franchisee, is in any way affiliated with the original franchiser company. In Table 3.2, we can see how a number of different platforms bring together distinct types of customers and create value by facilitating their direct interaction. Chapter 2. Customer Network Harnessing when he joined Life Church in Oklahoma as a pastor, Bobby Grunewald was only two years out of college, but he had already built and sold two web-based businesses, including an online community for fans of professional wrestling. At Life Church, he focused on a community of a different kind. 
He was brought on as innovation leader to help the three-year-old evangelical church find new ways to reach a contemporary audience and engage them in Christianity. Many churches today use podcasts or streaming broadcasts of their weekly sermons to reach parishioners on their commute, at home, or wherever they can listen. Life Church has gone much further, building a digital mission that includes on-demand and live streaming video services at lifechurch.tv and a platform of technology tools for other churches to use as well. During the heyday of the Second Life online community, Greenwald built a virtual church to reach believers in their 3D avatar forms. He has bought Google ads to reach people searching for pornography and steer them to a church experience instead. As he tweeted, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. To reach people no one is reaching, we'll do things no one is doing. Grunewald's biggest impact, though, may be in creating Uversion, the world's most popular Bible app for smartphones. With more than 168 million downloads, the app rivals some of the biggest mobile games and social networks. Uversion allows users to read the Bible in over 700 languages, from Eastern Arctic Inukitut to Hawaiian English Creole. It is the only mobile app in the world that includes such obscure languages as Bolivian Guarani. Within a given language, there are numerous translations, including 30 versions in English, from the King James Bible to the New International to the ultra-modern The Message. Readers can pick and choose a translation, search for any passage or phrase, and highlight, bookmark, and share what they are reading with others. Readers share more than 100,000 verses a day directly from the app. Every Sunday, screens are aglow in the hands of parishioners at nearly 2,000 churches that use version to conduct their services. As ministers preach, Life Church TVs serves track 600,000 requests per minute and register which verses are most popular in different communities. That helps Life Church choose the daily Bible verse that is sent out to all 168 million users of the app. Other preachers, from megachurch founder Rick Warren to Reverend Billy Graham, use version to distribute their own custom reading plans to followers anywhere around the world. Rethinking Customers On demand, customizable, connected, shareable. The same qualities that LifeChurch.tv offers to engage its digital age parishioners are what customers seek from every business today. As we begin to build our playbook for digital transformation, the first domain of strategy that we need to rethink is customers. In order to grow, companies have targeted them with mass marketing tools designed to reach, inform, motivate and persuade them to buy. But in the digital age, the relationship of customers to businesses is changing dramatically. Table 2.1 Customers Strategic assumptions change to the digital age from the analog age. Talking of some other different industry where this change relationship is clearly observed in the music business. Not long ago, the only role of the customer was to buy a copy of the latest product, a CD or an LP. To sell their products, record labors relied on a few mass channels for promotion, radio airplay, MTV and distribution, chain record stores, Walmart. Today, customers expect to listen to any song at any time streaming from a variety of services on a variety of devices. They discover music through search engines, social media and the recommendations of both friends and algorithms. Musicians may skip the record label and go directly to the customers themselves. They ask customers to help fundraiser for an album before it is even recorded, to share it on their playlists and to connect their favorite bands to peers in their social networks. Customers in the digital age are not passive consumers, but nodes within dynamic networks, interacting and shaping brands, markets and each other. Businesses need to recognize this new reality and treat customers accordingly. They need to understand how customer networks are redefining the marketing funnel, reshaping customers' path to purchase and opening up new ways to co-create value with customers. Businesses need to understand the five core behaviors – access, engage, customize, connect and collaborate – that drive customers in their digital experiences and interactions. 
and they need to leverage these behaviors to invent new communications, products, or experiences that add value to both sides of the business-customer relationship. This chapter explores how and why the relationship to customers is changing in every industry and what the challenges are for enterprises that develop in the mass media era. It presents a framework for understanding customers' network behaviors and motivations. And it introduces the Customer Network Strategy Generator, an ideation tool for developing breakthrough strategies to engage your networked customers and achieve specific business objectives. Let's start by looking more closely at how and why the relationship of customers to businesses is changing so fundamentally. The Customer Network Paradigm Today, customers' behavior, how they find, access, use, share and influence the products, services and brands in their lives, is radically different than in the era in which modern business practices arose. In the 20th century, businesses of all kinds were built on a mass market model. In this paradigm, customers are passive and are considered in aggregate. Their only significant role is to either purchase or not purchase, and companies seek to identify the product or service that will suit the needs of as many potential customers as possible. Mass media and mass production are used to deliver and promote a company's offerings to as many customers as possible. And for decades, it worked. Throughout the 20th century, this approach built the world's largest and most successful companies. Figure 2.1 Mass Market Model Now is the time when we are in the middle of observing a substantial change toward a new paradigm which can be termed as customer network model. In this model, the firm is still a center actor in the creation and promotion of goods and services. But the new roles of customers create a more complex relationship. No longer are they relegated to a binary role of buy or do not buy. In the customer network model, current and potential customers have access to a wide variety of digital platforms that allow them to interact, publish, broadcast and innovate and thereby shape brands, reputations and markets. Customers are just as likely to connect with and influence each other as they are to be influenced by the direct communications from a firm. Borrowing from the rich theories of network science, which date back to 18th century mathematics and have been applied to model that spread of language and disease and the structures of railroads and nervous systems, we can see customers as nodes in a network, linked together digitally by various tools and platforms and interacting dynamically. Figure 2.2 Customer Network Model In a market defined by customer networks, the roles of companies are dramatically different as well. Yes, the firm is still the greatest single engine for innovation of products and services, and still the steward of its brand and reputation. But while delivering value outward to customers and communicating to them, the firm also needs to engage with its customer network. It needs to listen in, observe the customer's networked interactions and understand their perceptions, responses and unmet needs. It needs to identify and nurture those customers who may become brand champions, evangelists, marketing partners or co-creators of value with a firm. One of the main points in the model of customer networks is that a customer can be any key constituency that the organization serves and relies on. Customers may be end consumers purchasing a product or businesses purchasing professional services. For a non-profit, they may be donors or grassroots volunteers. In many cases, it is important to look at a range of interconnected constituencies that are all within an organization's customer network, end consumers, business partners, investors, press, government regulators, even employees. All of these types of customers are critical to the business of a firm and all of them now exhibit dynamic, networked behaviours in relating to the firm and to each other. Chapter 3 Things at stake for digitalization. Digitalization is certainly not going to be that easy to come by, rather it will be hard enough. We feel like idiots that we aren't there yet. Why aren't we on board? Why is our company so immature? The fact is, transformation is hard. It is hard, hard work. It takes discipline. It won't happen overnight. 
it isn't free. It will cost us not only a little, but a lot. A lot of convincing work needs to be done, both to ourselves as well as our leaders and decision-makers. Otherwise, what is the point of it all? It requires discipline. That's why the quality movement created tools and techniques, many of which are still used in corporate Six Sigma efforts. Here are a few posts that describe this type of discipline. So why should you make an effort? This cannot be answered by anyone on your behalf. You must decide it is worth it. What benefits do you think will come from it all? Is it really worth it? Is this something you see being engaged in five years from now? The why of it all is important to know. So here are some questions to answer. First, what is this about? Second, what does it mean? Third, what is the end game? Fourth, what should you do next? Fifth, how do you want to accomplish this? Sixth, who needs to be involved? Seventh, where in the organization should leadership come from? Eighth, what are the requirements or constraints? What is the return on the investment in the stunning? What would the answer be if you asked your customers the following question? Can you imagine the world without XYZ company? On a scale of 1 to 10, what would your average rating be? You have a number of alternatives before you as a digital executive. Which will you choose? One filter should be which of the experiences will create an emotional connection. Have you factored that into your decision analysis? You can actually measure the difference in terms of engagement. Does one alternative improve engagement or not? Some level of rigor in measuring the results will help. There are constraints in terms of investments. Consider small tests with some level of A to B split analysis. A to B tests are not just for the marketing department. Here are the key ideas. First, there is a difference in the mediocre or ho-hum experience and the stunning. Begin to believe in the amazing. If it inspires you, it will inspire your customers. Second, decide you are going to decide. Not seeing you have alternatives can create inertia that can undermine progress. Third, Reacting to customer pain points is a net zero game. It stops the bleeding but doesn't improve your health. You do need to stop the bleeding, however. It can be ignored. Fourth, having stopped the bleeding if you need to, start investing in the stunning. It is one thing to prevent a problem. It is another to improve your well-being. Fifth, in considering your investment in the amazing, test your alternatives to help make the decision. What is at stake? But not every standards competition ends with a single winner. Today's smartphone market is roughly divided between Apple's iOS and Google's Android. Each of these operating systems is a software platform vying to attract more software developers that will build apps. In addition, Android serves as a hardware platform for different manufacturers, like that of Samsung, and these in turn are trying to compete with Apple and its trademark product, iPhone. This list is not exclusive. New platform businesses could well arise that don't quite fit any of these four types. But these categories provide a useful way of thinking about the differences among current platform businesses. Direct and indirect network effects one of the key features of platforms is that their value increases as more customers use them. This phenomenon is commonly called network effects, but there are actually two different kinds of network effects that can impact the growth of a business. Direct network effects, or same-side network effects, occur when the increasing number of customers or users of a product drives an increase in value or utility for that same type of user. In communications theory, this is commonly dubbed Metcalfe's Law. When the first user purchased a fax machine, the utility was zero. Who could they dial? As the number of users increases, each additional user leads to an exponential increase in the number of potential connections that can be made in the network. Direct network effects occur in platforms such as Facebook, which is a platform because, unlike a fax machine, it brings together not just users but advertisers, publishers and app developers as well. For platforms, the more common type of network effect is indirect network effects or cross-side network effects. 
These occur when an increase in the number and quality of customers on one side of the platform drives increasing value for customers on the other side of the platform. You don't sign up for Visa because it has lots of other cardholders. No direct network effect, but the presence of lots of Visa cardholders does make it more attractive for a merchant to accept Visa. Strong indirect network effect. Are indirect network effects reciprocal? Not always. In advertising-supported media, the indirect network effects usually run only one way. As the number of readers increase for a newspaper, its value to advertisers increases as well, but increasing but increasing the number of ads in each issue does not directly increase the value for readers. The one exception would be classified ads, where the ads really are the content that the audience goes to the publication to read. For media companies, that imbalance is critical in determining pricing for both sides. But for platforms other than ad-supported media, the indirect network effects usually do work both ways. Airbnb renters like to see more hosts to choose from, and hosts want to see more potential renters on the site. When indirect network effects happen both ways, they drive a virtuous cycle, with new customers on each side increasing the attractiveness to the other side. This is what drives extremely rapid growth and a highly defensible market position for a platform like Airbnb or PayPal that becomes a leader in its category. The Platform Spectrum any business today faces a strategic choice of whether to pursue a platform model or a more traditional business model. Should you hire a group of experts or cultivate a network of them? But the choice is not a simple all-or-nothing decision. The right business model may be somewhere on a spectrum from platform to non-platform. Consider the second defining quality of platforms. They allow direct and independent interaction between the parties they bring together. In practice, this independence may happen by degrees. Both Uber and Relay Rides allow owners of cars to provide mobility to those without them. In the former, the car comes with a driver. In the latter, you borrow the car and drive it yourself. But whereas Relay Rides lets riders offer their own price, Uber imposes standardization around rates. Within the category of electronic gaming, both consoles like Microsoft's Xbox and app stores like Google Play act as platforms bringing together designers who gave games to sell and gamers who are looking to buy. However, the console makers exert more control on the interaction, although the game developers set the pricing, the actual purchase contract is between the gamer and Microsoft. Chapter 4 People Perspective Employees are not expected to conform as much as they are expected to be involved and engaged. The primary communication focus of the executives is one of why change is important rather than what is changing. The digital executive knows in his or her heart that with engaged employees there can be no true transformation. The leader knows that every employee needs to own creating amazing customer experiences. It is not the leader who is accountable. All of us are accountable. What this is about is really a change in the culture and ultimately the soul of the company. The digital executive doesn't shy away from that reality. If senior executives are not on board yet, that is job number one. Not much of substance will happen until the sea suit embraces transforming the culture of our world. Beyond changing the culture, a people issue, processes need to be aligned to support digitalization. This takes time and energy. It takes discipline and effort. This is a commitment to see it through to the end. Discipline is the key. We need to change processes in place that are sustainable. If we don't have it, we must get it. It is worth the time and effort. Beyond that, middle managers are crucial to transformation. Most change will not start with frontline employees. Without a true commitment of the heart and soul of the employee who is in front of the customer right now, not much will happen. One obstacle to overcome is the amount of time devoted to learning. Do middle managers have enough time to learn how to improve the customer experience? Are agendas for most meetings focused on what can be done this week to improve the experience? Do we spend enough time learning what frustrates our customers? Here are the key ideas. 
First, in digitalization, leadership has a purpose in its approach of creating a long-term change which should be sustainable. Second, employees are not expected to conform as much as they are expected to be involved and engaged. Third, instead of the frontline employees, the key leverage teams mostly comprise of the middle-level managers. Fourth, digitalization is the primary mission of the digital executive. Fifth, what this is about is really a change in the culture and ultimately the soul of the company. Sixth, beyond changing the culture, a people issue, processes need to be aligned to support digitalization. Seventh, discipline is the key. Eighth, begin with the end in mind. Ninth, executive leadership commitment and buy-in is essential. Tenth, customer-facing employees will win the battle. Eleventh, one obstacle to overcome is the amount of time devoted to learning. Is it about checking the box called training or is it about learning? It is actually about both, but many times we think of it as a training problem when the real issue is about learning how to create great experiences for our customer. The digital executive knows that learning to focus on the customer is more important than training on customer service and then moving on. Learning is then not about what to do, but includes, at its core, why it is important to have great customer experiences and how to continuously improve. While employees may have gone through some training, they are never trained. Thinking about CX training or any training as a milestone is dangerous. The goal isn't to complete some training sessions, but to get people to behave in a way that's consistent with fulfilling your organization's brand promises. Keep in mind that companies throw a lot of information at employees, so it's easy for them to forget what they've seen in training or to think that it's no longer relevant. Also, there are always new people entering the organization who have not been exposed to some of the training. Fallacy 10. We've trained our employees. Customer experience matters. Here are some recommendations for shedding this fallacy. First, Making an assumption that people might forget or ignore, if you assume that employees will forget or ignore what they've learned as soon as they leave training, then you will have the right attitude about what you need to do. Second, focus on ongoing learning. Rather than thinking about delivering training, think about enabling ongoing employee learning. Third, Identify the things that you want employees to know, believe and do, and then find ways to reinforce those specific things across multiple mechanisms. Fourth, instead, develop measurements to track the areas of training that are most needed by each employee or group of employees. As much as possible, deliver training that aligns with these gaps. Fifth, help managers reinforce the application of learning. Make sure that managers understand their role and are equipped in supporting the learning of their employees. The bottom line, it's about ongoing learning, not training. The relationship they may have had with your mission and brand in the past has probably already changed. New technology, from a customer point of view, promises a new era of engagement, two-way conversations, shared experiences and community. The relationship you want to have with your customers through these new devices and platforms and the actual state of customer engagement are not one and the same. We need to properly estimate the extent to which even the briefest of exchanges can improve the relationship. We discover information differently, share it like never before and connect in ways we never could have imagined even five years ago. Our customers are driving rapid adoption because of the radically different nature of the experience itself. Yes, it is a device that unlocks that experience, but their expectation of the experience they want to have with us is changing as well. Are they having those experiences with you? All of this is moving away from a luxury to an expectation. As far as you know, that is exactly how customers are measuring their experience with you today. It takes more than just showing up on the right channel and right device. Experience is much more than that. Experience is about being a part of a movement. Here is a critical question. Do you have a user-customer experience team? To a great extent, the user experience, from a digital point of view, is king. 
It is about the art and science of shaping how your customers feel about your programs, products and services they engage with. Unless the design is intentional, the customer will have a suboptimal experience with your mission. An empowered user experience team offers you a powerful competitive advantage. So you may ask it again, do you have a talented user experience team? User experience and the professionals that staff it go way beyond design and development. They want experiences. They want to connect with the community. They will invest in the experience and embrace your community if you provide it. They will share that experience with others who will want to connect with your mission as well. Without powerful user experience professionals, you don't have a competitive advantage. It is how you will gain and retain mission loyalty now and in the future. Without thoughtful and intentional user experiences, connected customers will meander without direction. Their attention will wane and their loyalty along with it. Conclusion What is a platform business model? Vagueness abounds in the current use of the word platform, whose most general meaning is something on which you can build. In tech circles, a platform may be any underlying software on which additional programs are built. In media industries, it may mean a distribution channel. In marketing, it may refer to any brand or product line that could be used to launch additional products. In the context of this chapter, however, we will be discussing platforms in a specific sense as a kind of business model. Origins of Platform Theory the idea of platforms as business model has its origins in the economic theories of two-sided markets developed by Jean-Charles Rocher and Nobel laureate Jean Triol, along with Thomas Eisenman, Jeffrey Parker, Marshall von Alstein and others. Their work examines pricing and competition in markets where one business serves two different types of customers that are dependent on each other. They found that the two sides often show different price sensitivity and that, in effect, markets one side often subsidizes the other, e.g. advertisers subsidize the cost of media for consumers and merchants cover the transaction costs of credit cards for the shoppers using them. The study of two-sided markets led, in turn, to the realization that the same effects could be seen in markets with more than two types of customers. Visa and MasterCard, for example, bring together not just the consumers who use credit cards and the merchants who accept them, but the credit-issuing banks that back them as well. This led to the more general concept of multi-sided markets. At the same time, the theory began to shift from looking at the market dynamics, i.e. who will pay what price in equilibrium with others, to looking at the kind of businesses that make them possible, i.e. what distinguishes the business model of a Visa or MasterCard and what its success factors are. The term in economics for the business model at the centre of a multi-sided market is a multi-sided platform or just platform. Platforms don't compete just with traditional businesses. Uber versus a traditional car service. They also compete against other platforms. Uber competes with Lyft in the United States and with Didi Kwaidi in China. All three are platforms. But how do platforms compete with each other in the same category? Not on the same factors, features, benefits, price, location that differentiate traditional products and services. Instead, platforms tend to compete on five areas of value.